Reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 6 through 9. Now as a concession, not a command, I say this. I wish that all were as myself am. But each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. To the unmarried and to the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Good morning, Grace Evergreen. My name is Sam Whitehawk. <clears throat> I'm one of the pastors here along with Jeff, and I'm excited I get to preach the gospel message to you today. Uh, so if you haven't already, please turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and verse 6 is actually where we're going to begin today. Um, but I thought I'd give you a little context, just a reminder as we're seven chapters into uh, a letter that was written by the Apostle Paul. Um, so Paul is a former religious terrorist. He was saved by Jesus, and he was sent by Jesus to start churches and to write half of the New Testament. And so Corinth, where this church was located, was a major city in the Roman Empire in the first century, and it was a hub of all kinds of business and all kinds of sin as well. Um, so when Paul plants the church in the city, he begins to preach the gospel message to people who come in to the church who are new Christians and they have all kinds of ideas and a lot of them bad ideas as to how to live even though they are now Christians. And so Paul is responding to a letter that they wrote to him. Uh, they had all kinds of questions, but, but Paul is also responding to reports of the ways in which the, the church of Corinth was living. Um, and so one of the themes and issues that he's dealing with is is um, around marriage. And so he has to deal with these reports because people are living uh, contrary to the way the gospel would actually have them live now that they are in Christ. And so one false view that people tended to have was around the topic of singleness. And so it's no surprise that in another letter, Paul had to address uh, this same issue. So if you consider uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, it should be on the screen there, but uh, Paul says, now the spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, expressly says that in later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage. And so these false teachers who are being led astray by false demonic doctrines are teaching people or forbidding people from being married. So Paul says this warning comes from the Holy Spirit. This is going to take place. This is a common unbiblical demonic idea to forbid marriage. And yet all throughout Christian history, there have been groups that have leaned towards the idea of forbidding marriage. So what I love about the gospel is, and that the gospel is the good news of Jesus' death and resurrection, is that the gospel begins to impact and transform every aspect and area of our life. And so although we come in with maybe some, some wrong ideas or some incomplete ideas about topics from uh, marriage and family and careers and uh, singleness, the gospel begins to shape our understanding around who Jesus is and what he has done for us. And so the gospel gives us a new understanding with regards to the topic of marriage. And, and it's good news as we walk through 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 7. Because we'll see the world has all kinds of ideas about marriage and sexuality. But the gospel has just as much to say. And so what we'll see all throughout uh, this letter here, especially these chapters, is that the gospel addresses all kinds of wrong ideas and false teachings on marriage. We've already seen a couple bad ideas uh, in chapters 5 and 6. Bad ideas um, that, that stem from questions like, is it okay to celebrate incestuous relationships between a fellow church member and their stepmother? You saw that in chapter 5. Or is it okay to visit and to sleep with temple prostitutes? Again, this is what we talked about uh, in chapter 6. And so if this were a call-in radio show, uh, chapter 7 would bring in all kinds of callers with these kinds of questions. 
Is sex wrong now that we are Christians filled with the Holy Spirit? Is it okay to deny my spouse sex because I have a mistress? Um, Or can I withhold sexual intimacy because I want to hurt my spouse in some way? Is it okay to deprive my spouse of sexual intimacy because I'm now a Christian? Or is it wrong for me to remain single, widowed, or divorced because I am a Christian? Questions like, should I divorce my spouse now that I am a Christian and he or she is not? Or, I'm a widower or a widow. Do I have to be remarried? Or, I'm engaged and I became a Christian. Should I now call off the marriage? Or this one, I'm a Flames fan. Can I still consider myself a winner? All these bad ideas and more are addressed in 1 Corinthians 7. Uh, Okay, I made the last one up. That was for Jeff. But the rest of the questions and statements are addressed in this one chapter. And so as we go through uh, this passage today, although I only have four verses, um, I've reviewed the message a couple times, and at no point will I tell married couples to go have sex afterwards. However, I recommend you listen to Jeff's message last week as we opened up 1 Corinthians 7 to get context for that statement, and we've already seen God's beautiful picture and plan for marriage. God loves marriage, and God created it, so we we can't... um, We can't forget that as we move on to the topic of singleness. But today, we're going to address two false ideas on singleness in the church. Okay, Two uh, myths that we're going to look, look at. Myth number one is to be single is inferior to being married. To be single is inferior. Myth number two, to be single is superior to being married. So as we look at our passage today, we're going to address both of these, but let's start with uh, prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you that we have the opportunity to open up your word, um, to look to the scriptures, and I pray that you would speak through me, and would you change our hearts as a result of um, your word. So we thank you for this time, Lord. Amen. Okay, so let's start uh, in our passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 6. That's where we're going to begin. Paul says, now as a concession, not A command, I say this. I wish that all were as myself am. But each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. And so we begin our passage and verse six simply means Paul saying, I'm not saying this as a command. I'm saying this as a recommendation. Paul advocates for singleness. That's what we're going to get to. So as we begin with our first myth, it's important for us to understand the context of singleness in first Corinthians seven. There are three uh, categories or people groups throughout this chapter that I'm just going to group under one word, single. And those people are, number one, widows and widowers. So people whose uh, spouse has passed away. Number two, divorced. So whether someone's been divorced or, or their spouse has left them because of their faith in Christ. So divorce would be the second group. And three, never married. So anyone who's never been married, whether you're young, whether you're engaged or dating, wherever you're at in that season of life, never married would be the third people category. But for the sake of simplicity in this passage today, I'm going to refer to all three people groups as single. Even though throughout chapter seven, Paul's actually going to address each group um, separately. And so the first misconception is that if you are in a season of life where you are divorced or widowed or you've never been married, that somehow being single is inferior to being married. That somehow you are lesser of a person or a Christian because you are single. And sometimes that comes from the church. Sometimes it comes from wrong understanding of scripture. Many times it could just be a cultural thing or traditional thing where Uh, where to be single is viewed as being inferior. But the Bible never actually says that. If you're single or in a season of life where you're single, you are not second class as a human. You are not a tier below those who are currently married. 
And this is good news, and it's something that we need to be reminded of as the church, and we also need to uh, proclaim and believe. Because in our society, especially uh, if you consider Hollywood and, and this romantic love or this you-complete-me uh, notions of love, it makes it seem like being single is, is the worst. A death sentence or a lonely island um, where those who are single must have done something wrong or must be doing something wrong. And if you're in this season of life, please reject that lie that somehow being single is inferior to being married. Paul in 1 Corinthians, he rejects this myth right away. I mean, you look at uh, verse 7, he says, I wish that all were as myself am. Paul was single. And he's saying, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind, one to another. Verse 8, though, he says, to the unmarried and widows, to the single, I say that it is good for them to remain single. So again, consider Paul The Apostle Paul, the church planter of the church of Corinth, the author of half the New Testament, was single. And as I was uh, studying this passage, um, I heard and read a number of times, some some believe that Paul may have been uh, married at one point. Uh, He said, you know, maybe he's referring to himself as divorced or as widowed. Um, I've always heard and believed that Paul was single, and I still uh, believe that. So I can't confirm either way, but I thought that was an interesting thought, that maybe for some reason Paul uh, was single over the course of his ministry. But but like I said, Paul is single as he's writing this. I fully believe that that he was. Um, And he's saying, I wish that more were actually like myself. So again, Paul is recommending, he's advocating, not for an inferior life, but he's recommending singleness because it is a good thing. So pop quiz, anyone can answer this. Who is the most famous single person to have ever lived? Jesus. Jesus. I thought you were going to have that. That would have been your second guess. Jesus. Okay. And so God himself, God come in human flesh, was never married. And so before we put value judgments on singleness, or before we come to sinful ideas and conclusions that singleness is somehow inferior, let's remember that Jesus was never married and he was perfect. Bonus question, okay? For the kids, for those that didn't get the last one. For believers in Christ, when Jesus returns to bring heaven to earth and we get to live with Christ forever, will we be married or single? Anyone? Adults, you can help them out if you want. You you will be dead (laughs) and you'll be resurrected. (laughs) You will be single, okay? We will be single. So I don't know how many of you kids or how many of you have heard that or understood that, but we will be single. We'll be unmarried. Look at Matthew uh, chapter 22. And this is Jesus speaking. He says, but Jesus answered them, you are wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. So for some quick context here, the Sadducees come to him trying to trap him with a question. And Jesus is telling religious people who knew the Bible, you're wrong. You've got a wrong understanding here. And then he tells them this. He says, for in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And so Jesus was single. Paul was single. And in the new heavens and the new earth, every follower of Jesus will be single. So let's reject the myth together and believe the truth in our hearts that being single is not inferior to being married. Let's not believe this just on paper, but actually let's believe this in our hearts. And let's view one another, regardless of our season of life, as equal. And for married couples, if this is true, that singleness is not inferior, one way that we can love single people is by uh, stopping to ask them if they've met someone or if they're dating or trying to play matchmaker, unless you're asked to do so. Let's love people and not treat them as though somehow their season of life is inferior to yours if we are married. It's a practical way that we can uh, apply what we believe and know to be true. 
to be single is not inferior to being married. So if it's not inferior, what should we say about it? Paul says two things in our passage today. Uh, If you look in verse 7, Paul says, I wish that all were as myself am, but each has his own gift from God. And then in verse 8, he says, it is good for them to remain single. So Paul says, this is a gift from God. It is a gift. And then he says, it's good for them. So understand that if you are single, depending on the season that you're in, neither of those statements may feel true. You may look at me and say, hey, it's easy for you to say that, that it's a gift and that it's good. And I want to acknowledge that this can be a very difficult season. I'm not making light of anyone's um, circumstance in life. But I want you to know that I'm not lying or I'm not just saying things to make people feel better. But this is truth from scripture that being single is good and it is a gift from God. And this isn't just coming from me, but this is the very words of God, inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. So let's look at both. One, singleness is a gift from God. What Paul is saying here is simple. Singleness isn't for everyone. And to remain single while being self-controlled or or sexually pure and holy in our actions, uh, we'll talk about this more in a bit, but to remain single is a gift from God and requires a gift from God. It's not something that one can do uh, contentedly with joy and peace and self-control. You can't do it without the Spirit of God. And to remain celibate or, or single and sexually pure is a gift and requires a gift from God. So it cannot be done without him. We must rely on God for that gift. But it's also a reminder that you can be single and glorify God. You can be single and be like Jesus and live for Jesus and be fully satisfied in Jesus while not being married. Being single is a gift. So number two, how is singleness good? And I'm going to address this in a little bit here, pretty quick, uh, after we talk about our second myth. But, But I want you to trust again that God isn't lying when he says that to remain single is a good thing. There's uh, a moment in the Gospels when uh, false teachers with false views on marriage come to test Jesus by talking about divorce. And so Jesus responds by saying, the only acceptable reason to divorce is for sexual immorality. And this actually shocked the crowd who had already bought in to false views on marriage and divorce. They were used to divorcing a woman based on trivial matters. And so in Matthew chapter uh, 19, Jesus says this, or, or the disciples, after hearing Jesus talk about divorce, the disciples just threw their hands up. They said to him, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it's, it's just better not to marry if I can't divorce her for any reason. Um, so that's where their heads were at. But, but Jesus said to them, not everyone can receive this saying, but only those to whom it is given. For there are eunuchs who have been so from birth. And there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men. And there are eunuchs who have, been made th- who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let the one who is able to receive this, receive it. And so eunuchs has uh, a, a primary definition, but it can be used broader. So I wouldn't read this into saying that Jesus is saying some actually crushed their genitals in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. Um, but, but he's saying that more of an understanding that some have committed to a celibate single lifestyle for the rest of their lives in order to serve Jesus and his kingdom forever. And you look at the apostle Paul as an example. And so as Jesus mentioned, there's ones who can receive it and they will receive it. It is given to them. As Paul said, some have a gift of singleness and that gift can, can, one way you can recognize it is that you're content being single with God, whether in this season or for the rest of your life, being content and satisfied in God is a sign that you have a gift and it's a good thing. And it's completely fair and scripture seems to lead towards this that for a large majority of people, being single um, is, 
is a minority. So being married will be more of the majority. But we must never think that being single is inferior to being married. It's a gift from God. And Paul says it's good either way if you are going to remain single or to get married. So myth number two, our second myth is that being single or singleness is superior to marriage. So just as there were some in the church who wrongly believed that singleness was inferior to marriage, there was also another faction or group of people that held our second myth, that being single somehow was superior to being married. And so remember that Paul was single and Jesus was single. Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. So, so many believed that being single made you a better Christian than the one who was married. And this was demonstrated by some living as though they were single in their own marriage by refusing to be sexually intimate with their spouse. We've already read about that. And this was demonstrated by Christians who were married thinking about getting divorced. Two Christians thinking about getting divorced so that they can each be single and serve God on their own. Again, a false view. And and we'll talk about that next week. Or it'll come up soon, but for the man or woman married to an unbeliever thinking that they should divorce them because their spouse is not a Christian and that they should now be single because somehow that is holier. And all of these these wrong views, um, Paul will address in chapter 7. And so just as with any pendulum swing, the tendency is for us as Christians in the church is is to go too far, to swing too far to one side or the other. And so it was in the church in Corinth. They were going too far and they're now um, elevating the status of being single superior to those who were married. And that's just not right. They were assuming that you would be more holy or simply put just a better Christian if you were single. And this, of course, can lead to pride. It could lead to division or self-righteousness, all kinds of other wrong thinking. And so verse 7, Paul seems to imply explicitly that marriage is also a gift, just as being single is. Just as singleness isn't for everyone, neither is marriage, but one isn't superior to the other. Now, the theme of self-control is evident all throughout 1 Corinthians 7. Self-control meant that you were honoring God with your body. You weren't just saying, my spirit is redeemed, I can live however I want with my body. To be self-controlled is to honor God with your body and your mind. And so you're not going to, uh, like in chapter 6, some were wrongly thinking that they can go and visit uh, temple prostitutes or that they could sleep with someone uh, outside of the covenant of marriage. Paul addresses that. So, um, But he says, look at verse 8 and 9 in our passage again. Paul says this, To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single. We talked about that. As I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. So Paul is saying in this instance, for those that cannot exercise self-control, that it's actually better for them to marry. So marriage isn't relegated to some inferior status again. It's, he's saying, in this situation, if this is you and your season of life, it is better to marry. And you can glorify God in doing that. So saying that someone is um, not able to exercise self-control, that may mean that they're outright uh, sinning. But um, there's also something else going on here by that phrase, burning with passion. It means to be consumed with a passion for marriage and for sexual intimacy and for having kids and all that goes along with, uh, with marriage. And Paul's saying, if, if that's what consumes you, then it is better for you to marry and not think that you have to remain single because of maybe false teaching or, or whatever is going on. So, so you notice that it's not that Paul's flip-flopping, but he's elevating both against false views of the other. Marriage and single, they're both gifts. And he's saying it's okay to be married. And marriage is actually a way for, um, for believers to experience the, uh, the benefit of sexual intimacy rather than uh, burning with passion if they are single. Because again, being single, being content, being self-controlled is a gift from God a gift of the Holy Spirit. 
So marriage is a good thing, so is being single. At first glance, one may wrongly assume that only those who are single are those who are self-controlled. Again, leading to the myth that, that being single is superior to being married. But the truth is that being married also requires self-control. A spouse, once married, cannot just give in to any sexual urge or temptation. So self-control as a fruit of the Holy Spirit must be exercised in marriage as well. However, the covenant of marriage, as we learned about last week, is a safe place for sexual intimacy to to take place and to be God-glorifying. And that's what we learned last week. So I want to point out another thing about this myth. Being single doesn't automatically mean you are self-controlled or that you will be. Being single can open up all kinds of temptations and opportunities to sin. Consider the temptation to sleep with someone who is not your spouse or to consume uh, online uh, pornea or pornography, sexual immorality, as we've already learned about. Being single doesn't mean that you're going to be self-controlled. And also being single doesn't mean that you're going to remain that way forever. So we got to remember that whether you're married or single, you must exercise self-control. It is important to be self-controlled and to be on guard against the temptation to sexual immorality because it affects married and single. So again, I want to remind you that if someone is single, it doesn't automatically mean that they are holier or superior. Uh, I just want to take a look at 1 Timothy chapter 5. And uh, Paul deals with widows in the church. And and again, doesn't have uh, very good things to say at the moment. He says, uh, chapter 5, verse 11, but refuse to enroll younger widows to enroll, put them in like a a food care program. program essentially where they're taking care of widows who are truly widows he says for when their passions draw them away from christ they desire to marry and so incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith besides that they learn to be idlers going about from house to house not only idlers but gossips and busybodies saying what they should not so I would have younger widows marry, bear children, and manage their households, and give the adversary no occasion for slander, for some have already strayed after Satan. So for those who are single, if they aren't married, um, they're not to just spend their time gossiping or, or being lazy or stirring up trouble. For some who are single, when they desire to marry, they are tempted to be led away from Christ. It said wandering from Christ, straying after Satan, incurring condemnation. That's not because they wanted to be married, but it's because in the temptation or the desire to be married, they lowered their standards and married someone who is not a believer. And in that case, they end up taking on the religion of their spouse and being led away or drawn away from Christ. And Allison and I have actually seen this exact uh, scenario with a woman uh, we once knew, and it's very uh, sad. So this is why if you are single and desire to be married, there's one rule. Okay, there's, there's probably more than one rule, but, but the most important aspect of any prospective spouse is that they are a believer, a Christian, a follower of Christ. A Christian is not supposed to marry an unbeliever for the exact reasons I just read in 1 Timothy Um, And so it still happens, sadly, because many people just want to be married. They don't want to be single anymore for whatever reason. And so they compromise and they try and justify, well, you know, we're in love or I can change them. But Paul gives clear instructions at the end of chapter seven. He says, uh, verse 39, he says, a wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is free to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. So this is another topic for another time. But uh, before we get too sidetracked, let's remember that being single doesn't mean that you are a superior Christian to someone who is married. And being single doesn't automatically make one self-controlled and holy. We must all strive to be like Christ and to live for Christ. So I want to consider one last thing though. For the single person following Christ and living for him, there is the potential for greater devotion. 
greater devotion. And that's, uh, we'll talk about that. Consider Paul's words in um, our passage looking at verse 8. He says, To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. So Paul says remaining single is good. It's not a, a consolation prize. It's not subpar or inferior, but it's good. So we know it's acceptable to God and it can be glorifying to God, but I want to consider a couple ways that this is uh, good. And I don't want to steal too much thunder from, uh, from upcoming passages, but let's look at chapter 7, verse 32. Paul says, I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife. And his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. So I want you to notice a couple things about uh, this passage. One, the married Christian has divided interests. These aren't evil or bad. They're just divided. It says the husband is anxious about pleasing his wife. The wife is anxious about pleasing her husband. Divided interest. But Paul says that the single person is anxious about the things of the Lord. And for those who are single, if they so choose, they can focus solely on pleasing the Lord, which is good. And so that's why Paul wants people to be single like him. It's not because he was lonely and he wanted a support group. It's not because he just hated sex or or children. It's because he wanted to secure people's undivided devotion to the Lord. And this is obvious when times are good, but it's even more essential when times are evil and persecution is an ever-present threat to the church. Uh, I don't have it on the screen, but in um, verse 28, Paul says, uh, but if you do marry, you have not sinned. Uh, But he says, yet those who marry will have worldly troubles and I would spare you of that. You see, marriage is hard enough and a bad marriage can be excruciating. And I've heard Matt Chandler, he's uh, part of Acts 29. He once said to a group of singles in his church, he said, based on counseling many people who have been through messy divorces, that being single is far better than marrying the wrong person and ending up in a bad marriage. And we have to believe that as a church. And so Paul's heart here is for people to be devoted to Jesus Christ. Because at times marriage, um, it can help in our devotion, if two partners are committed to spurring on one another to love Jesus Christ more. But at times, being married can be a hindrance as we deal with the day-to-day grind of raising a family and living in this world as selfish and sinful people. And so for the single person, there's a tremendous opportunity to use the time and the money and the energy and your life in devotion to Jesus Christ, our Lord. And that is good. But... One thing you got to remember is that singleness can be a hindrance if as a single person, your sole focus is on being married or having sex or having kids instead of being content in your season of life and satisfied in Jesus Christ alone. And so in this case, Paul says that it's better for single people and they're free to marry. But I wanted to close with this. At chapter uh, 7, verse 40, Paul says, after talking about people who are divorced and and can be uh, married again if their spouse is divorced, um, basically saying that in my judgment, she is happier if she remains as is. And then I think that I too have the spirit of God. A little tongue in cheek there, but he's basically trying to say that if those who choose to remain single, Paul's saying that I think they will remain happier that they will be happier in the Lord as a single person, more satisfied in God if they remain single. And so again, I wanted to address both the myth of single being inferior and single being superior. And Paul uh, elevates both singleness and marriage. And as the church and as believers, regardless of our season, we got to remember that. 
that both are good. Both have their place in the church. And so as I close, I want to say this. For the married and the single in our church, regardless of what the world tells you, or any cultural tradition, or any uh, misguided views from the people in the church, whatever they say, our identity doesn't come from our season of life or our marital status. Our identity, first and foremost, is found in who we are in Jesus Christ. As redeemed and adopted children of the living God, we all find our place in the kingdom because of Christ's death on the cross for our sin. And we receive new life in him because of his resurrection from the grave. And so like Jesus was raised, we too will be resurrected with our new bodies. And as single individuals fully united in a community and family as a bride of Christ, we the church will give Jesus Christ our full devotion forever. And this is good news for all of us, whatever season of life that you are in. So let's believe that. Let me close in prayer. Father, I thank you for um, your word. And I thank you for the way that you address uh, many people in different seasons and circumstances of life, regardless of what the world and culture says. And so I thank you that um, you have a place and a calling upon single people in our church, and you have a place and a calling upon married people in our church, and together would we give you our love and devotion. So thank you for Jesus. Amen.